Dear Patrons, Today we are presenting a short film on the history of dialysis. We will delve into the revolutionary journey of hemodialysis, pioneered by the remarkable Dr. William Kolf, a name that hardly needs any introduction in the dialysis industry. He is also known as the father of dialysis. Through the dedication of the DCDC team, we have unearthed rare and unseen footage that captures the essence of this life-saving therapy. Join us as we explore the passionate story behind hemodialysis, a treatment that has saved millions of lives worldwide. So, fasten your seatbelts and prepare to be inspired by the incredible history of dialysis and its profound impact on patient care. So, let's get started. On March 17, 1943, the Dutch physician William Koff began treating the world's first patient with kidney failure, whose condition was alleviated with the help of hemodialysis. It was the birthday of the artificial kidney. Its story began with the fear of talking about death and ended with success, despite enemy occupation, military shortages of drugs and mortal risk, which Dr. Koff faced himself. To start this story, it would be correct to begin from the very origins of hemodialysis. The problem of cleansing blood has occupied medical science since ancient times. In ancient times, it was believed that many diseases occurred from the mixing of body fluids. To clean them, various decoctions of a mixture of plants and minerals were used. These actions were, for the most part, ineffective or even harmful to the patient. Interest in blood cleansing flared up at the beginning of the century when, with the development of biochemistry, many processes in the human body became clear. The physical foundations of hemodialysis were laid in 1854 by the Scottish scientist Thomas Sins, who published his work entitled Osmotic Force. In this work, he first described a method for making a semi-permeable process of diffusion of crystalloid solutions through parchment paper called dialysis. He also proved the relationship between the size of the molecule and the rate of diffusion. The larger the molecule, the lower the rate of diffusion. Fifty years later, John Jacob Abel created the first apparatus for removing substances dissolved in the blood. Research was carried out on dogs with removed kidneys. During the experiments, the possibility of effectively removing nitrogen not bound to proteins from the blood was proven. However, the small area of the filtering membrane apparatus did not allow it to be effectively used for blood purification in humans. As a means of preventing blood clotting when passing through the apparatus, sternum, an anticoagulant obtained from leeches, was used. Due to the low effectiveness of the drug, thromboembolic complications were a serious problem. The first hemodialysis in a person, a patient suffering from uremia, was introduced in Germany by Dr. Georg Haas in October 1924. Purified sternum, whose antigenic properties did not allow dialysis for more than 60 minutes, was used. However, in 1927, heparin was used for the first time in hemodialysis as an anticoagulant. Thus, Haas was the first to bring together all the components necessary for successful hemodialysis. He used an effective and safe anticoagulant, created a device with a large membrane area and provided an effective supply of blood to the filter membrane. The first case of successful removal of a person from a uremic coma using hemodialysis occurred on September 3, 1945. The Dutch physician William Koff introduced hemodialysis into clinical practice, improving the device developed by Georg Haas. The main purpose of hemodialysis was to combat uremia. As a result of blood purification using hemodialysis, it was possible to reduce the concentration of urea in the blood and bring the patient out of a coma. On September 11, 1945, a significant improvement in the patient's condition was achieved and the threat to her life was eliminated. For the first time in practice, the clinical effectiveness of this method was clearly proven. In 1946, William Koff published the world's first manual on the treatment of patients with uremia using hemodialysis. However, the beginning of the era of chronic hemodialysis is considered to be 1960, when Belding Scribner and Quentin Scribner managed to solve the problem of long-term vascular access. 
On April 10, 1960, it was announced in Chicago about the new device. Long-term vascular access was provided by implanting two thin-walled Teflon tubes into the radial artery and saphenous vein. The outer ends of the shunt were connected by a curved Teflon tube, which was removed during hemodialysis, and hemodialysis was connected to the shunt. But all this was in the future, and for now, it was 1938. Looking at his father, the director of the tuberculosis sanatorium, Willem did not want to be a doctor. Everyone saw the triumph with which the doctor discharged those recovering, but only his family knew what it was like for him when a patient died, and it was necessary to inform his relatives. It seemed that he himself would not be able to bear such a conversation with the patient's relatives. So, when his natural inclination towards medicine nevertheless won, and Koff graduated from university, he began to look for some department where he could conduct scientific work. However, by the age of 26, he managed to get married. The professors did not want to take on a family graduate student, arguing that the doctor should be available 24 hours a day. Only Leo Polak Daniels from the University of Groningen agreed. He was the only Jewish medical professor in the Netherlands, and he considered a person who got married and at the same time wanted to do science as acceptable. He did not assign his own topics to graduate students, but for a certain minimum amount, young people had to answer questions. Koff was allocated four beds, one of which was occupied by a 22-year-old country boy named Jan Bruning. He was slowly dying from uremia with all the terrible symptoms, Beyond the limit of pressure, headache, loss of consciousness, vomiting, blindness. After Bruning's death, the young doctor was faced with the same nightmare he was so trying to avoid. The patient's mother, an old peasant woman in a black formal dress with a white collar, came and it was necessary to tell her about the death of her son. Koff, oppressed by the powerlessness of medicine, thought about how the patient died because of the extra 20 grams of urea accumulated in his blood after kidney failure. How could this be so, he thought. It was already the autumn of 1938. Kidney failure had been described a century ago and doctors still had not learned how to remove waste from the blood. The principle of blood purification was proposed back in 1861 by Thomas Graham. When blood is uremic from a translucent membrane, for example, into a bull's bladder, and this bag is lowered with a saline solution, then the membrane immediately establishes justice. On one side there is urea, on the other there is not. It equalizes the concentration. And if there is a lot of saline solution outside, a whole pool, then the urea content in the blood drops to almost zero. Graham called this phenomenon dialysis which in Greek means end-to-end -end decomposition. Blood dialysis, the so-called hemodialysis, was done on dogs in 1910, but animals did not tolerate this procedure well. Georg Haas established in the 20s that people withstand it much better. Blood clotting outside the body is completely prevented by heparin. But even during the most successful experiment, Haas removed only two grams of urea from the patient's body. Koff also read that the best semi-permeable sausages were produced in Holland. The fashion for hot dogs was just spreading. The sausages were prepared in American cellophane from a wine company. It was durable and cheap. If you added urea to the blood, which you poured into a cellophane tube, you got a sausage 40 centimeter long. It was enough to rinse this sausage in saline for 20 minutes so that all the urea would come out. To completely clean the blood of an adult, 10 meters of cellophane tubes should be enough. Koff came up with the idea of winding it on a drum that rotates in a solution. Professor Daniels welcomed these experiments and allocated funds for them until Holland was captured by Hitler's troops. Jews were forbidden to hold any positions. When they began to drive them into the ghetto, Daniels and his wife took poison. The new professor, appointed by the Dutch National Socialists, did not want Koff so he was hired as a therapist at the hospital in the city of Kampen. His salary was 10,000 guilders a year. With that kind of money, it was possible to build an artificial kidney on his own. Although for this, he worked as the only therapist for the 23,000 inhabitants of Kampen, the chief doctor allowed him to experiment at night. 
Koff bought up all the stocks of American cellophane tape for sausages in the capital and ordered their apparatus at the Kampen enamelware factory. It was made there by a bug and a lightweight stainless steel drum from the duralumin fragments of a German bomber shot down in 1940. And since all the enterprises of the occupied Holland were supposed to work only for the Wehrmacht, the factory could not issue an invoice for its machine. The factory was unable to pay for this work. As compensation, the director, Henrik Burke, was co-authored in the first articles on hemodialysis and thus entered the history of medicine. The drum was driven by a motor from a Singer sewing machine, which Koff's wife refused. For 15 minutes, Koff manually rotated the drum until the cellophane was damaged from the rupture. The solution leaked into the tank where the drum instantly knocked it into foam, which poured onto the floor. Since then, there have been tiles on the floor in the ward so that you can run to the dialyzer like pebbles. The first uremic patient who did not fall out with blood, forgotten during the deportation to Switzerland, was the old Jew Gustav. After that unsuccessful procedure, he never came out of a coma. Without the patient's request, it was impossible to judge the clinical effect of dialysis. The opportunity to evaluate it presented itself in March 1943. One of the last few ambulances brought a 29-year-old cleaner named Janice Raver. Her father, an elderly peasant, came with her. As happens with membranous nephritis, the patient went on dialysis from a specialist of a completely different profile. She had gone to an ophthalmologist complaining of decreased vision. The ophthalmologist referred her to a therapist. Within three months of observation, the girl's well-being quickly deteriorated. By March 17th, she almost closed her eyes. Her pressure was 245 to 150 and her pulse was a 100. Murmurs in the heart indicated inflammation of the pericardium. She had constant vomiting, nosebleeds and chest pain as if stones were lying on top. The urea content in her blood was growing rapidly and hemoglobin was falling. Her mouth smelled like urine and she did not quite understand where she was or what they would do with her. I tried to explain everything as simply as possible. Your blood is poison. We'll take some of the blood, clean it of the poison in the machine, and return it back. If you agree, I promise nothing bad will happen to you. I believe you, doctor, but will she definitely get better than this? Her father asked. Unfortunately, I can't guarantee that. Then let the pastor come first, and then start. After Pastor Gan talked to the patient, they took her to the ward alone and took her out of the radiation room. They drew 200 millimillions of blood and poured it into the injection drum. Upon contact with air, it quickly turned red. From this observation, the idea of artificial lungs was born. 22 minutes of dialysis took place without an emergency. The urea dropped from 172 million gallon per cubic centimeter to just five. But it was only a glass. Still, the next morning, the patient said she felt better. Her blood pressure was high and the urea content was slowly increasing, but it certainly didn't get any worse. After two days, the second dialysis was already a liter of blood. After the third day, one and a half liters. The pressure dropped slightly, but she experienced the same torment. This time, on March 31st, a needle was inserted through a rubber tube. The blood flowed to the drum from where it returned through another needle into the vein. The entire dialysis group, led by technician Bob Van Nordwijk and Koff himself, felt something unprecedented was happening. In a few hours, 12 liters of blood passed through the device. The pressure briefly returned to normal, and it was possible to extract 24 grams of urea at once. Everything went well until the needle was pulled out of the artery. Because of the heparin, the blood did not stop, and the tourniquet didn't help. The girl was saved when the surgeon tied the artery. The next day, the swelling of her eyelids subsided and Janice's full vision returned. Now she could read the newspaper and she didn't vomit so often anymore. The following dialysis, in which glass instead of rusty needles were inserted into the vessels, went even more successfully. But by the twelfth procedure, all the large veins and arteries were so damaged that there was no more living space left to connect. It was necessary to stop treatment and leave the girl with the disease alone. She was brought out of a uremic coma four times, but the poisoning continued. 
On April 12th, death occurred. After the autopsy, Koff began to be tormented by his conscience. Had he played too much, as his head physician put it? What were these 26 days of tension if the patient suffered almost all this time? The girl's father tried to give Koff money, but he refused and tried to run away. The old man insisted, and finally, Koff named the amount of 60 guilders, his two days' earnings. The peasant paid the money and went to bury his daughter. Unsuccessful cancer, sulfur poisoning, complications after pneumonia and surgery, almost all of these people would now be saved. But Koff had no shunts invented later, no antibiotics, no normal needles. The American cellophane was running out, and the German cellophane bought on the black market was cracking even while being wound up. By the fall of 1944, it was not dialysis at all. And treating someone during the last war, autumn and winter, Koff, as a therapist, issued fake certificates to get rid of work. He treated 803 simulated patients. He walked around the edge. A German military doctor sometimes checked his diagnoses. Moreover, the Campen Hospital also prepared an assassination attempt on the chief of the local Gestapo and treated the wounded from the combat cells of the Dutch resistance. It ended. In the barracks, instead of those forcibly taken to Germany, Dutch fascists and collaborators were detained. One of them was 67-year-old Sophia Haste, who was admitted to the ward with acute renal failure. She was the 17th dialysis patient. She had already been written off as hopeless, almost in a coma, with a blood pressure of 250 to 160. She only babbled and reacted to exceptionally strong pain. After 11 dialysis sessions, the urea pressure returned to normal. The doctors thought the patient's eyelids began to tremble. William Koff leaned over her and asked, Mrs. Moan, can you hear me? She slowly opened her eyes and answered, Now I will divorce my husband. The next day, her kidneys started working. It was a sensation. For the first time in human history, after a uremic coma, a patient was discharged as completely healthy. However, from the hospital, the old woman was returned to prison. To survive, she gave out the Medina Fino. Fortunately, the head of the local resistance fighting squad had once received a life-saving certificate from Koff and spared the old woman whom a year and a half ago he would have shot without a second thought. Mrs. Haste actually got divorced. She moved to another city where people didn't know about her crimes. She started riding a bicycle again and died seven years later from a pathology not related to the kidneys. Based on her medical history, Koff defended his dissertation and became a professor. His first lecture was called How to Live Without Kidneys and Heart. Both of these fantastic ideas he personally brought to life, which we use even today.